Hello everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Crown and today we are going to have some more stories that I hope that you will enjoy. But before we start, it would be so much appreciated if you would subscribe to the channel, like the video if you enjoyed it and maybe leave a comment down below. These simple clicks would mean a lot to the future of this channel and really reward the effort that I put in every day. And now, without further ado, let's go. First story. My ex abused me for years and also tormented other girls, so I told his college about it. Among other things. I dated my ex for around 3 years online. I'm in Canada, he's in the UK. He cheated on me and he wasn't supportive. He would gaslight me and freak out on me for doing things like going to perform at a piano recital, doing homework instead of calling him or wanting to do homework after I washed my hair instead of calling him. He dumped me five times and it was his way of punishing me for things he didn't like. For example, he spent the night talking to another girl on New Year's. And when I asked him the next day about it, he made me feel like I was terrible for asking him, even though he cheated on me before this. And he ended up dumping me later that day. My family knew that something was wrong with him because when my family flew to the UK and I saw him, because of my family wanted to do other things on the vacation, like see Stonehenge, he freaked out because I told him I couldn't meet him again and said that he was going to die by suicide. Eventually, a month after he broke up with me for the fifth time, I lost my feelings for him. I left him and started dating someone new. My ex then contacts me persistently through Reddit, Discord, Facebook, SMS and even through my IRL high school best friend. Not only that, but he repeatedly kept trying to get me unmoderated from the label community that I moderated, and he kept telling people that I cheated on him with a music artist. I tell the staff at the label what's going on and they unmoderate him. But he still keeps taps on me through a group of friends and continues to spread bigger and bigger lies about me, to the point that he claims that I have been stalking his in real life friends. I end up going to therapy where I'm diagnosed with generalized anxiety and depression and the health professionals that have seen me all agree that the triggering factor for me developing these disorders was my ex's abuse. So now I'm on antidepressants and need to go to therapy for the foreseeable future and I'm registered as disabled with my university because my disorders count as a disability. Meanwhile, I found out that he's also been hurting other girls. One of my friends was pressured into spending time with him. Another was trapped in a 7-hour call with him and she didn't know how to get out of it, which caused her to have an anxiety attack. She also has a history of cutting which worries me. A third feels villainized by him and is worried of him breaking all of her friendships with music artists at the label. A first girl who is friends with him was lied about. He claimed to me and his other friends that she came on to him when she said she didn't. However, for some reason he has a giant friend group of mainly girls from the label community who all seem to have some kind of sexual connection to him. And I don't exactly understand why when he seems to treat girls very crappy. I went through the legal route and filed a police report. I also have spread a 200 plus page document on all of his behavior to the label community. I sent that document to his college. Many, girl, many girls came forward and contacted me, telling me their side of the story and asking me about the steps I took. I gave them all the information about everything I did and about 10 of them confirmed with me that they went to the police and reported him. He was taken in for investigation a few days ago and hasn't left the police station since. Next story, met a very disabled vet, Karen did not like his volume and I made her pay. So I got on my flight yesterday for a short 1 hour and 20 minute flight. Start chatting up the dude I'm next to and he's very loud but extremely nice. I quickly figured out he's a disabled combat vet. I thanked him for his sacrifice, he got teary eyed and me too to be honest. He was in the first Gulf War, his neck was messed up and his life is on disability now. All the while I'm getting this information, Karen is in the seat in front of me with earpods in. 
She keeps looking over her shoulder and trying to shove her earbuds in further. She's clearly getting physically frustrated and every time my new buddy talks again, she has to do it all over again. Now normally I might talk less to a loud child or a loud drunk etc, but this guy is telling me his life story and he's also a big sports fan. Packers for those that care. And I'm a big sports fan, Seahawks. So we have a lot to talk about. He's obviously lonely. Wife divorced him after the accident and doesn't hear from the kids much either. And yeah, you guessed it. Karen has taken to leaning forward in her seat, continues to look over her shoulder, and at this point she's probably suffered brain damage from shoving those earbuds in. I'm ready for an earbud, screw Karen and her attitude. Pretty sure everyone else has figured out his disabled, and I'm getting genuine smiles from everyone else around. So I just keep making small talk about politics, he knows a lot, and sports and weather. And my work in Alaska, which fascinates him. Best part is each time we have stretches of silence, I'm the one restarting the conversation, and Karen keeps side glancing me, clearly having stomach troubles, as she rocks forward again, wincing as she pushes a cursed earpod closer together. My pity revenge was to ignore her completely and continue doing what I was doing. He was awesome and deserves mad respect for his sacrifice. Next story is hopefully the final update of a story titled My friend made fun of my disabled uncle. For context, I have a disabled uncle. He is autistic and has PTSD. We call him Pruno in these posts, yes, because of Encanto. He sometimes requires minimal care such as help eating or brushing his hair when he has bad days. My friend came over during the day when he needed help eating. And my grandmother and youngest brother were helping him. She decided to make a big deal out of nothing, made fun of him and accused my family of abusing him and my youngest brother. Some time later, my ex-friend's dad got involved. I was talking rudely to me, so my uncle got involved and was hit by the entitled dad. We pressed charges on him. Now we had the trial this past week. It was two days. Not sure how much I can say, so I'm going to be a bit vague. I also was not in the courtroom the whole time as I was a witness and could not see the other testimonies, so some of this is coming from Bruno. But first, here is a laugh. My mother was watching a crime documentary about cops using security cameras to solve crimes. Mom says, that's cheating. Bruno, walking through the living room to go to the kitchen confused, asks, what's cheating? The cops using the cameras. Well, the criminals are cheating in life, so I think it's okay. I swear I could make a book of Bruno's one-liners. Anyway, on to the nonsense. My father's main argument was that Bruno assaulted my ex-friend and he could not be held responsible for his reactions as he was protecting his baby from a 45-year-old man. Throughout the whole thing, the dad and his lawyer tried to make ex-friend sound a lot younger than she was. She's 18, not a child. This was disputed as Prono and his ex-friend had never been in the same room alone and have barely had a conversation before. It also came up that my uncle has not expressed any interest in women for many years. You could see the color drain from BD's lawyer's face when this fact was brought up. According to Prono, they know they were screwed at this point. My disability required me to have some procedures that render me uncomfortable to get into a relationship. It messed up with my hormones levels. Prono said, they went through the evidence which was mainly the police report and footage from the store. When I took the stand I corroborated that my ex-friend had never been in the same room alone as Prono while in our house, as she was always with me as she was my friend. I also recounted the day of the assault. My ex-friend was one of the last people to take the stand. She tried to backpedal and said that she felt uncomfortable by my uncle and that she looked at her weird. She was eventually forced to admit that Prono never touched her or said anything of a sexual nature to her. It was amazing to see. The judge said I'm sorry that you felt uncomfortable by a man with special needs living his life as a man with special needs. 
I'm sorry that you felt uncomfortable that a man with special needs has to have his needs met and that they are being met. A special needs man living his life and you being uncomfortable about it is not. However, a reason to spread false allegations, intentional or not, Mr. Entitled Dad, a special needs man being in public is not a reason to assault him, no matter what he may have done. I love that judge. At the end, the Entitled Dad ended up with a Class A misdemeanor, the most serious misdemeanor as he assaulted a disabled person and caused a public disturbance. He got three years in prison and a fine of four thousand dollars. The entitled dad was pissed but the judge told him just be happy that you will be out in time to see your daughter graduate university. So that's the end. I'm happy that we are all able to move past this and that this chapter is closed. Prono is doing fine, he seems much more at ease these past few days and is looking forward to Isa's wedding next month. He's currently teasing his sister about being addicted to Candy Crush in the other room. It is all back to normal. Next story. Entitled mother gets thrown in jail and blames everyone but herself. A few years ago, my mom ended up in jail for knowingly and intentionally violating a court order, which as any person would guess is illegal. She was fully aware that what she did was illegal, but according to her, it was everyone else's fault but hers. In her eyes, she was allowed to do whatever she wanted to do because she was a struggling single mother who just wanted to provide for her kids. As we know, she did not get two cents about me. Anyway, after her arrest, I had to go live with some rather distant relatives I had met during my lifetime until then. Since my mom was really my only custodial figure, my relatives, a distant aunt and uncle whose daughter married into our family, were absolutely lovely people and were happy to take me in until the thing with my mom blew over. It never did. After living with my mother for my whole life and dealing with her nonsense, I was so incredibly happy to be living with other people. They treated me like more of a daughter than my mom ever did. And honestly, they parented me more in a month than my mother had in the previous three years. Naturally, if my mom isn't making everyone miserable, she is not living. Even behind bars, she was tormenting me. Every day she would call the landline at my aunt and uncle's house. She would call four times. Then when no one answered, she would call my uncle's cell phone twice. Then when he didn't answer, she'd call my aunt's cell. Twice. She did this from 8 to 9 in the morning, then 2 to 3 in the afternoon. Do not ask me how this woman got so many phone calls in literal jail. But why were we purposely dodging her calls? I'll tell you. At first, we would answer the calls and try to entertain her. I would pick up, say hello, and receive nothing but endless screaming from the other end. In case you haven't noticed, I'm in jail, she would say. As if that was like not to my own knowledge. That was followed by some more screaming about how awful it is and she doesn't have toothpaste or can't wear earrings in jail like I'm supposed to do something about it. Then she would make her demands. You need to get me out of here. You need to get me a lawyer. And you better do it fast. I don't have time for this nonsense. At the time this was occurring, I was 15. I was busy with school most of the time and this was not a priority of mine, I said. You get a public defender though. And she went insane. Can you not act stupid? I need more than an idiot straight out of law school. I need someone who will care and actually help me. Okay. My stupid teenage self actually sat down and went through a white pages. Calling attorneys and leaving voice messages. Most of them were confused as to why me, a child, was calling in for a grown A woman. Pretty much every attorney I could get to call me back either said they didn't take cases such as my mom's, they were busy with other cases, or just a flat no because they didn't want to. All very valid reasons. My mom did not like hearing this. She accused me of lying about calling any attorneys, and that I was just making things up so I didn't have to do anything. She asked why my aunt and uncle weren't helping me, and I just said, I don't know, but really, they couldn't stand my mom. 
They recognized she was abusing me and just being a trashy childish person in general. So naturally, they decided to stay out of this mess, which I completely agree with. Soon enough, my mom took her demands a step further, telling me I needed to write into Dr. Phil, Nancy Grace and Oprah. She said she needed her case to have national attention. I knew this was a stupid idea when I heard it, like any of these people cared about my idiot mom getting herself tossed in jail. This is where we get Super Saiyan Entitled Mom. I was in a grocery store one day and I saw one of my mom's old co-workers. My mom used to work at a thrift store that was affiliated with a women's charity organization that dealt with domestic violence and drug abuse. We said hello and then he asked me, is your mom still in jail? And I said yes. And I asked how he knew about that. It was never on the news. He then told me that my mother had sent him a 15-page handwritten letter asking the organization to start an individual charity fund just for her to cover her bail, attorney costs, and court fees. Additionally, she asked that the minimum goal be $1 million. This is not a joke, okay? My mom tried to start a GoFundMe from behind bars. She did not write into the local paper or maybe some personal friends she had none. She wrote to an organization that helps women get into rehab programs and out of abusive marriages. This woman had the audacity to beg for money from a group that doesn't care about idiots in jail. Her argument? I'm a single mom. Being a single mom sucks and it's hard. But this woman did nothing to ever change our financial situation. She did not work for nearly a decade for no reason other than laziness. Briefly worked odd part-time jobs here and there. And then stopped working again. My jaw dropped to the floor when her co-worker told me this. I was so embarrassed. Finally, one attorney I called before called me back and told me his rates. Why he thought of the case and so on. I relayed this message to my mom. And what does she say? Why is he charging me? Did you tell him I'm a single mom? He should be taking my keys for free. Obviously, I don't have that kind of money. My aunt, uncle and I were sick of this nonsense. So they actually called up a police officer they were friends with and asked him about how she gets access to so many phone calls. He said he would look into it and it turns out she made a deal with someone in jail to get her a phone. This was found out. She got punished for it by taking her phone away and a few months of extra jail work. And a few months of extra jail work. We later found out she got into a big fight down there and got severely injured. None of us cared. None of us even batted an eye. She got what she deserved. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.